Yes, he is. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In spite, yeah, Bill, that's right. Exactly. In spite of ourselves. That's a good way to put it. Not because of ourselves, but in spite of ourselves. Oh, my goodness. We serve a loving God, a God that moves on our behalf, that works uh, miracles and uh, circumstances and life and incidences and all of that so that we can be moved toward our purpose in life, that God has given us an assignment. Uh, God has moved in our life. I see you. many of you have the outline uh, that I put out for you today, and, it, and you see on it, uh, I am anointed. And if you look at the top, the header of it, you'll see, uh, you'll see the edge, God's strategies for success. And uh, I don't want to sound like some kind of a salesman today, but I just wanted to make you aware over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at, at the, yeah, it's all right to sell Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, just want us, I just want us to know that over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at um, the edge that God gives us. Uh, what, does God, what, what does it mean to be a child of God? And what does God do in our lives in order to uh, help us be successful in the assignment that he has given us in life? otherwise known as uh, our purpose. Mm -hmm. We're going to use the life of probably everybody's favorite Bible character or many people's favorite Bible character, King David. I mean, King David's life is really almost uh, illustrative of anything that you want to talk about in life, Uh, good parts and bad, Uh, up times and down, Uh, anointings and failures and strengths and weaknesses and you seem to find it all in David's life because God just exposes so much about this wonderful king from which Jesus himself found lineage from the king of, from David the king and just a tremendous uh, amount of information in the Bible that tells us all kind of dynamic things that are good for us to know and exciting for us to know. And we're going to not look at his whole life, obviously, but I, I really want to just look at that little small section of David's life that leads up to his confrontation and including the confrontation with, with Goliath. Uh, we all know that, that David is intended to be the king of Israel from a boy. David is anointed to be king of Israel, and that's his ultimate assignment is to be the king of Israel. And so that's his purpose in life. But along the way, there are, there are secondary assignments that that, that must be accomplished to lead David as he moves toward the, the master design of his life. And, and I'm just saying to you that this is the way God moves in our life. God does this, and, and it's done through a, a word that many of us only know as a church word. When you see the word, you think, you know, church. It's, it's the word anointing. It's the title, I am anointed. Everybody say that, I am anointed. Uh, do you really believe that? I mean, really, I, I know you say, well, Pastor, you said say it. Well, yes, I did. But, but there's a lot of difference between saying it and believing it, you know, that I am anointed. And I, 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 let me just, just kind of cruise a second in, in this concept of anointing, just, just for a moment, because, I, listen, I've been through everything. I mean, I've been in the ministry for 43 years. I've been, the first church I pastored had five people in it. It was a mission church that split. And my pastor sent me out there when I was 18 years old and said, get out there because they need somebody to help them decide whether they're going to stay together or sell the church and you need to practice. So get out there. And I went out, there's five people and uh, I swear, you know, I started 18 years old, 43 years. I've been churches of all sizes, shapes, country church, city churches, big churches, little churches, mission churches. I've been in the mission fields everywhere. I've been in India, and I've been all in South America and Guatemala and Mexico and all of those. I mean, I, I just had a 43-year adventure with the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you that I've been through almost anything that you can name about church life and about uh, understanding church terms and words and so forth. And let me just say to you about the word anointing. The word anointing is most likely one of the most misunderstood words that we have in church vocabulary. Because when people say the word or hear the word anointing, most of the time, 
we're thinking of magic. We're thinking of uh, uh, special empowerment to do uh, supernatural things. And, and if you're anointed, you, you, you walk higher, you stand straighter, you uh, are more powerful, your words carry more weight. I mean, there are just all kinds of connotations that are carried by the word anointing. But may I say to you that simply, and you'll see this, I think you'll see it today, but you'll certainly see it as we go through these five. God does anoint all of our lives. When you, are, when you come to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, you are anointed. Yeah, yeah. And an anointing is not, uh, look in the last little line of, your, of the of opening paragraph uh, in your notes. Anointing is not a halo of entitlement. In other words, if I'm anointed, it doesn't mean that I'm entitled to things that you're not entitled to, that I'm a privileged character, that I'm king of the pack, that I'm the head honcho, the big cheese in charge. I got the power. I've got the, you know, I'm special. I'm unique. I'm one, like, oh, you hear people describe, he's so anointed. What does that mean? Well, he's flashing, he's flamboyant, and he's persuasive, and he, you know, and he, he can jump and shout and spit and holler, and he can do all kinds of crazy things. He's anointed of God, as if somehow the word anointing means you're entitled. It's not a halo of entitlement. It's an, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's an empowerment to achieve. In other words, God anoints us so that we will be enabled and empowered and equipped to accomplish our assignment from God. An anointing is an enablement. Sure it is. It is a, it is a, it is a, a move of God on, on to, to a life, but it doesn't move in order to create some kind of a movie star, uh, religious uh, uh, following. It move, it's, it, it's there to give you an empowerment and an, and, and, and a, and an encouragement and equip you abilities to do what God has uh, for you in your assignment in life. And, and so here is David, King David, and in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see the beginning of David's uh, movement toward the purpose of God, the assignment of God. And, and here it is. The Lord said to Samuel, now Samuel is the prophet of God. Samuel is David's pastor. He's the prophet of God that ministers to the palace and to the king. And so God sends Samuel. He says, God says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Saul has been the king over Israel. He was elected because he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else. He was thought by the people to be the greatest man they had. So they elected him king in spite of the fact that God wanted to be their king. They said, we want a king. God said, I want to be your king. God, we want a king. Well, I want to be your king. Well, God, the Philistines have a king, and the Ammonites have a king, and the Perizzites have a king, and the Termites have a king, and everybody has a king. And we want a king. God says, I want to be your king, but go ahead and elect one. And they had an election, and they elect a guy not because he was spiritual, not because he was uh, dynamic, not because he was filled with God, but because he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Yeah, yeah, it even worked back then, guys, you know. And Saul had uh, defiled himself and defamed the nation of Israel and had done all kinds of evil things with sorceries and witchcrafts and all these kind of things and had just proven himself not to be a, a man of God and God had rejected Saul. God said, oh, Saul's got to go. And even though he's still sitting on the throne, he's dead man walking. Uh, we gotta, I got to get somebody else in there. So Samuel, uh, get off your pity pot. Uh, quit sulking around. Uh, I know it. You know, you're sad and down in the dumps because I, I said Saul's got to go. So how long are you going to pout about this is what God looks at him and says. How long are you going to be sad about this, seeing that it's me that's rejected him? You didn't reject him. I did. So get up off your pity pot, and, and, and I want you to fill your horn with oil, 
and be on your way. You know, and sometimes, listen, sometimes you just need to be on your way. In all of our lives, there are times where we need to be on our way because something that used to work for us isn't working anymore. Some, uh, uh, some set of life that used to be happening for us is not happening anymore. And, and God just simply looks at us and says, when life gets that way, move on. Move on, man. Just be on your way. The gift of goodbye, right? I've explained the gift of goodbye. It's one of the spiritual gifts, right? Yeah. You do it just like this. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. You're not for me. <laughs> no, you're not. You don't even look like anything God would want for me. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. I don't get closer to God with you. I get further away. Goodbye. So God says, God says to Samuel, be on your way. And Samuel begins to be on his way. And God says, uh, go down to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I've chosen one of his sons uh, to be king. And God sends Samuel on a mission to anoint, take that horn of oil now, a horn of oil, probably not a horn quite this big, but probably a, a, a ram's horn that was about half that big and it kind of shaped like a clam shell. And he said, fill that thing up with oil, get you some new oil, put it in there because you're going to need that oil. That's what he's going to anoint with, you know, and be on your way and go down there. And, and it's almost like God says uh, uh, to, to Gabriel or Michael, or one of the angels, uh, now <laughs> we're not going to tell him who it is. Now, you know who it is. David is the son that he's going to anoint. But God is, God didn't tell Samuel that. It was almost like, well, you know, it's going to really be a lot more fun if Samuel really doesn't know which one of those boys it's going to be. So we'll just let him go down there and let's just see if he can find him. Verse 2, but Samuel said, oh, let, me, let, me, let me turn it on here. But Samuel said, uh, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, He'll kill me. Saul's still the king. And, and, and he's crazy. <laughs> and David Samuel says, hey, God, if Saul hears about this, you know he's going to kill me, right? Now, how many of you know that God always has a plan? And how many of you know that God's plan is always way smarter than any plan we could come up with, right? And that God has so many things he can do. And so God says, oh, pff, hey, look, don't worry about the plan. Here's the plan. The plan is um, take a heifer. Now, a heifer is a young cow, a cow, not a bull, a young cow that hasn't had a calf. Unbred, no calf, young heifer, young cow. Take a heifer, he said, and, um, and, and, um, and, and with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So God has his plan. God says, don't worry about what we're going to do. You just get your heifer ready, get your heifer with you, and when you get down there, you listen to what I say, and I'm going to tell you what to do, and don't worry about what we're doing, and don't worry about what I'm asking you to do. Just obey the plan. So verse 3, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what, what to do. Uh, you are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Here's our anoint word in the Old Testament, to anoint. To anoint in the Old Testament means to take that, take that horn filled with oil. Now, I know you guys stand in the front, and we take a little bottle, and we tip our finger on it, and we put a little on your forehead or your hand, or, you know, we, we just, a little dab will do you kind of stuff. In the, in the Old Testament, no, no, in the Old Testament, no, it wasn't a little dab will do you. It, it, you, get the whole, you get the whole horn full of oil. A large portion of, of oil is poured on your head and it runs down your hair, if you're cursed to have any, down your face, down your, down your garments, all the way. That stuff runs from the top of your head down, down to, your, to your feet. And, and, and what it indicates is, it indicates that, 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 that this person who is anointed, whether it's a priest or a king or a warrior or whoever it might be, has been singled out to God for special favor from God. Now, don't get too excited about favor 
Because favor has some responsibilities too, right? And notice I did not say favors, plural, favors, like God's going to do you some favors. Like you can just kick back and God's going to do all the work. No, no, no. I didn't say that anointing gives you favors. It gives you favor. It gives you, it gives you a, a, a blessing, a, a place with God that brings some responsibilities with it as God anoints you and equips you and enables you and empowers you for a purpose that he's sending you on. And in the Old Testament, God sent prophets, preachers, to anoint kings and priests and soldiers and, 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 to, and to carry forth his anointing. A preacher would walk up with an oil in his hand and say, God sent me to anoint you, per, break the cap, boom, and, and the oil would go all over your body. Now, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, it's altogether different. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes. Everybody say, God himself and the, in the New Testament, God himself comes as the anointing. You remember, you remember last week, we looked at John 14, 15, and 16, right? All right, look here. This is in 14, and you'll remember this verse. I know you will. Look at them. Jesus is speaking in John 14, and he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Yeah, yeah. So in the Old Testament, God sent a preacher that carried some oil that when poured over you represented God's power, God's anointing being on your life when it comes to the New Testament. Jesus said in the New Testament, it is the Holy Spirit that fills us and anoints us and carries the power of God. In the Old Testament, God sent Samuel with a, with a horn of oil. In the New Testament, Jesus himself on his day of resurrection went, and went to heaven and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God and sat down on the right hand of God the Father and sent the Holy Spirit to fill our lives and to empower our lives. All right, from the inside out. That's why I said, you're anointed. You know the Lord, you're anointed. The Holy Spirit has filled your life. The Holy Spirit has empowered your life, has equipped you for life, has, has, has moved inside of you, and it's not some oil that's running down your face. It's the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of your life. So you say, what is my edge in life? Well, my first edge is, I have been anointed by God. I have been filled with God. My life is not like other lives. My life is different because I have living on the inside of me an advantage. And that advantage is God himself living on the inside of me. So let's, have, let's see four affirmations in David's life right now concerning our anointing. Everybody say, I am anointed. All right, God anoints me. All right, here's the first affirmation. The first affirmation is, I am anointed to accomplish my purpose. Now look at your neighbor after you finish writing the word in there. I am anointed to accomplish my purpose. All right, look at your neighbor and say, not yours, but mine. All right, I am not anointed to accomplish your purpose. I'm anointed to conquer, accomplish my purpose. Purpose. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, taking this a step further so we can completely understand what we're talking about here, talks to the church at Colossae in the book of Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. And the Apostle Paul says to the church at Colossae, he says, uh, there's been a really big mystery for, for countless millennia. And this mystery is about to be revealed to you because God is going to reveal the mystery of the ages to you. And the mystery of the ages is the fact that God himself is going to come inside of a believer and inhabit the body of a believer. Look at what he says. To them, he's talking to these Colossian Christians now. 
He says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What mystery, Paul? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I want you to notice there that that, that passage says, it says that Christ is in us, not on us. That he inhabits our life, that he comes on the inside of us and that, and that, that, that he equips us, uh, he, he enables us. The word Christ, the word Christ. What does, what does Christ mean? Jesus Christ. No, he's not Jesus' last name. Um, Christ is the anointed one. That's what the name means, the anointed one. Here is the mystery which the anointed one is in you, and that is the hope of glory. In other words, God himself comes inside of me so that I can be set on a course to accomplish the purpose that God has in my life. It's like, you know, I mean, you guys know I'm not real super techie. Uh, I've, been, I've been dragged into technology because I live in a world that's so techy, and I have to deal with work and everything else that has some techiness in it. But, uh, but, but just as an example, uh, you guys are, are aware of the iCloud, the cloud. I, I don't know. Where is the cloud? I, you know, I, I don't know. Is it like hanging around right here? or what? I mean, it, it's just some place where files go to be stored, and then if you need them, you can kind of recapture them and put them back where they need to be, and it's not in your computer. It's just kind of out here somewhere. Well, here's, the, here's, here's what I'm saying, that, you know, in order to get stuff in the cloud, uh, all you have to do is to turn on a little feature here on this little device and then turn on a little feature on this device. And then if these two devices get close enough, then they're going to swap information. They're going to just like automatically just send it. I, I don't know. It just goes in the air or something. It just and, and now they both have the same thing just because they've been close to each other. Uh, what I'm saying to you is in like manner, in like manner, I see some of you already ahead of me. Yeah. In like manner, when you come to Christ, when you, when, when you open your life and you invite Christ to take over your life, and, and, and by opening the door, you invite Christ in, you come close to Christ. You come close to God. And once you come close to God, according to this verse and according to uh, the, the anointing being in you, God takes what he is and puts it on the inside of you. Just automatically, because I belong to him, and I've given him permission. And now what he is, I am. So verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. That, that's why you need the anointing, by the way. Because you're going to need to do what God says, and it's going to be an adventure. So Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you, do you come in peace? Now, why would they be so afraid? And why would they ask him this? Well, it's because a prophet showing up in town wasn't always good news. Uh, a lot of times it was really bad news because the prophet had been sent by God to tell them that uh, the party's over like the angels that were sent to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, hey, have you seen the angels down there? Yeah, I sure have. Here comes fire and brimstone raining out of heaven. So the elders of the city look at him and, at, at Samuel and say, hey, Samuel, uh, have you come? Uh, you got taken a vacation? Uh, uh, you down here for something good? You come in peace? Yeah. And then Samuel says, uh, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice the Lord. Check out my heifer. You know, <laughs> I've <laughs> I'm, I'm here to sacrifice. Look at my heifer over here. See? <laughs> Tell Saul I got a heifer with me and I'm, we're going to sacrifice, right? All right, Samuel, right? Yeah, I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice the Lord. And then he begins to tell the citizens what to do. He says, consecrate yourself. Now, to consecrate just simply means set your own self aside. It means uh, get on your face before God. It means repent of that evil heart that you have. Look at your life. Judge your own life. Come clean with God. Uh, m make moves toward God. Come to the altar. Uh, weep some. Get right with God. Present get ready to be in the presence of God. That's what consecrate means. He says, tell them, consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and, and invited them to the sacrifice. 
All right, everything's good so far. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab as one of David's sons, Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. In other words, Samuel sees Eliab, and he says, man, what a good-looking boy. Look how tall he is, and he's so handsome. Surely that's got to be the one God's going to pick right there. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, another one of obviously of his boys, and he had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had, his seven, had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Sorry, Jesse. Your boys are wonderful. Your boys are, are handsome and they're tall and they're strong and I'm sure they're smart boys. Man, Eliab is such a fine boy. He almost had me at hello. I mean, I was, you know, I would have chosen Eliab, anybody. I'm telling you, and, 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 and I'm sorry that it's not one of your boys, Jesse. But I'm not the one doing the pitching. God, it's God that's saying that it's not the one. And then verse 11, so he asked Jesse, is this all you got? <laughs> Are these all your sons? Uh, well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him and we'll not sit down until he arrives. Now, I want to show you something about the anointing here. This is how the anointing works lots of times in our lives. David, when this when this ceremony starts of choosing the one that Samuel was there to anoint because God had some special assignment for him. When they called in the crowd for, for the ceremony to watch God do this, this is this special time in this young man's life that's going to never be forgotten by himself or the people. David wasn't even in the room. David was so, was so unimpressive and so undervalued that nobody even thought to bring him off of the sheep field out there, to even bring him in, into the room where the ceremony was going to start. But the anointing of God would, didn't choose any of the others. The anointing of God made room for the one that was so unimpressive and undervalued that no one even thought about him. And now the one that no one thought of that wasn't in the room has a special invitation and everybody else is standing up until he gets there. I'm just telling you, God has a place for those that he anoints and uses. So he sent for him. Let me get verse 12. So he sent for him. And he had him brought in. Look at him. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Now, I just want to call your attention to one thing uh, that's kind of interesting to me. Because back in verse 7, just a few verses ago, you remember what the Lord said, right? The Lord said, uh, uh, don't look at his appearance. Right? I mean, isn't that what God said? God said, don't look at his appearance. Because I don't look at what's on the outside. I look at what's on the inside. And now here's David being described by his appearance. What's up with that? Well, I'm just thinking, all right, here's what the Lord is doing. The Lord's telling us, yeah, you know, hey, look, David was a fine young man. He was a good-looking young man. But that's not why he was chosen. Not that, and I'm just going to spur off one second here. Not that appearance is never important. Appearance is important at times. So God's not saying that our appearance is never important. He's just saying it's not ultimately important. And that, that many times the way things seem 
are not the way God sees things. And that there is a difference between those who say they're something and, so, and those who really are something. And obviously, David really is something. He not only looks like something, he is something. You say, how do you know? Well, look at that last line. Look what God said. Rise and anoint him because he is the one. And so he gets, he gets his anointing. So the edge, number one, the first edge I get in life moving toward my assignment is I am anointed by God. Number two, just because I'm not visible doesn't mean I'm not valuable. Now, you need to catch this because I know there are a lot of complexes out there. I know there are a lot of inferiority thoughts. I know there are a lot of people who think negatively in themselves. They, think, they, they, they don't think they can accomplish. They don't think people value them. They think that they're, that they're undervalued, unseen, unremarkable, uh, and they have nothing really uh, capable to add in life. To that, I'm just going to say to you that even though you may not be visible, in other words, you may not stand out in a crowd. You may not be the first one thought about or the first one picked for the team. But just because you're not visible doesn't mean that you're not valuable. And I, and I stand on the fact that David wasn't even in the showroom when this meeting started. The meeting to pick who was going to be anointed by God, David is not even in the room, and yet David was the one who was chosen. But he was outside. He, he, nobody thought to get him. Nobody appreciated him. Nobody valued him. Nobody said whenever Samuel showed up, well, you know, it could be David. I mean, David is a great young man. David is a valuable young man. I mean, nobody even thought about David. I'm just thinking, what, what harm would it have done to bring David into the room? I mean, so you don't think he's the one. But he's part of the family. We want him in the group picture when this thing's over with, right? I mean, what, 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 what would it hurt to bring the little fella in? He's about 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that. What would it hurt to bring him in and just let him be a part of the crowd that watches God choose one of his brothers? That wouldn't have hurt anything. But, but he doesn't even get invited into the room. I mean, if they, if they were having an election about, all right, who is going to be the most likely one to be anointed by God, who's the greatest person in this family, who has the most credentials in this family, who is God most likely to use? I'm going to tell you, they never would have elected David. They would have elected probably Eliab. He seemed to be the, the favorite of Samuel. But David would have never got, got selected. I'm just so glad that God doesn't use nominating committees, aren't you? To choose, I mean, you precious people, I know some of you went... I saw it on your face. You went, what's, what's a nominating committee? <laughs> if you don't know what one is, just say, thank God. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. God doesn't, God doesn't take advice like that. And, and anyway, invisibility is not a sign of unimportance. Uh, I'm going to submit to you that, now, now think about this, and maybe I'm dragging you down something that I'm trying to make something out of, and you'll say, Pastor, you're just trying to make something up. But, but listen, this is what I think about it. I think, about, I think that David was not being forgotten by God when he didn't get invited to the meeting. I think David was being hidden. Because let me, let me tell you, I'm the oldest person, I'm the oldest child in my family. And I have two sisters and a brother. And they might even be watching now. Hi, y'all. They could stand up and testify what I'm about to say to you. When I was growing up and I got to a certain age where I wasn't a child anymore, I began to get certain things that were valuable to me. Bottle, like a bottle of cologne. Do you know that I had to hide my bottle of cologne from those three vermin, <laughs> or they would have used every bit of it. I had to hide everything that was valuable from them 
to keep it from being abused. And, and, and I'll take it a step further. The more valuable it was, the deeper I hid it. Didn't it, Lord? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The most valuable stuff you would never find. I mean, it, it, isn't, that, isn't that what the Bible says about the church and about the body of Christ? I mean, doesn't he say the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12? In 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about the church being a body and it has arms and it has hands, it has eyes, and it has internal parts that are hidden away and that the internal parts that are hidden away are far more valuable than the outside parts that everybody sees. I mean, you can live without hair, obviously, but you can't live without a liver. Nobody comes up to you and says, man, you got a beautiful liver. No, no. <laughs> they, don't, they don't say it because they don't see it. But it is one of the most, it is, you, you could probably live less time without your liver than any other thing in your body. You could probably could live longer without your heart beating than you could without your liver. I mean, it's ridiculous. But it's valuable, therefore it's hidden. And, and, and I'm just saying to you, look, you know, God... It may be in your life that God just can't, you know, just can't trot you out in, in every situation and just, you know, put you out there before everybody. He's saving you for something. I mean, he's hiding you back here because you're valuable. I mean, it's not that you're invisible or that he has forgotten you. He has hidden you so that he can pull you out when he needs you just in time because you hide stuff that you care about. Don't waste your energy trying to get people to notice you. God knows you. That's enough. Nobody else has to notice you and to make you valuable. God knowing where you are makes you valuable. So, so say, say this, say this. It's not what it looks like. All right, all right. Number one. I'm anointed to accomplish my assignment. Number two, just because I'm not visible doesn't mean I'm not valuable. And, and let me add this little thought. Uh, it's true about preparation. It's true about discipleship. It's true about growth in life. It's true about learning things. The things that no one sees pr often produce results that everyone wants. Let me say that again. The things that no one sees often produce the things that everybody wants. Just remember that. And verse 13, let's see here. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And look at what it says. And from that day on, the Spirit of God came powerfully, powerfully upon David. And so Samuel went to Ramah. Samuel says, my work's here through. The Spirit of God is powerfully upon David. David's a boy. David's 10 years old. David's not even close to the palace. And yet here it is. The power of God is already tremendously strong on David. From that point on, from the time the oil poured on him, before it even got down to his feet, the power of God came upon him powerfully. And everybody saw it and said, oh, man, God's going to use David. But watch this. Number three, I don't need a better assignment to experience a greater anointing. Are you hearing it? I don't need a better assignment to experience a greater anointing. I'll, I'll, I'll show with this. This is where I'm going with it. Verse 19, the power is powerfully upon him. The oil is still dripping off of him. The anointing has been accomplished. Oh, goody, now's the time for him to step into his, his assignment. Oh, we got, he's anointed, so let's let him get going. Look at this. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Saul hears about David because Saul's got this problem can't sleep at night, and he you know, has this terrible thing that happens to him. They call it a spirit that God sends to keep him disturbed. But when he hears music playing, he can, he can kind of soothe down. And David's a tremendous harpist, and he sings to his sheep and everything else. And so he's developed a lot of skill. And so Saul wants David to come play the harp so when this thing happens, he can get soothed and eased. 
And so Saul says, hey, go down there and get David. You know where he is. He's down there with those sheep. Right, yeah, yeah. Now, now my, my only point in, in pointing this out is that the last time we saw David, which was only about three verses ago, the last time we saw David, he was dripping with oil of anointing and the power of God had come powerfully upon him. And now three verses later, the next scene in David's life, he's, there he is back down there with those sheep. So his anointing was real. The power of God was real. It was on him. But God sends him right back down there to the sheep. Holy smoke. I thought he got anointed for an assignment. I thought he was going to be the king of Israel. He's going to be the greatest in all the land. And he's still dripping with anointing. And God, God, you sent him right back down there with the sheep. That's what he was doing before he got anointed. My goodness, God. David, I'm sure, was all hyped up for a promotion, you know? Oh, I got anointed. Man, the power of God is upon me. And everybody's saying, amen, yes, glory to God. Wonderful, you're the greatest in all the land. And he's ready for a new assignment. He's ready for, a, uh, for something better in life and something bigger in life. Oh, I've got the anointing. I'm a magic man. It's all, woo. Hey, God is going to use me. In great. And then God sends him right back down where he came from. With all the anointing, with all the enablement, with all the empowerment, with all the equipment, right back down there to do the same thing he's been doing. Hey, I can identify with him. I've been doing the same thing for 43 years. Same thing. God says, I got an assignment for you. And he, he fills me with his spirit. And then I start preaching. And I preach this week. And guess what I'm going to be doing next week? Preaching. And the week after that, where am I going to be? I'm going to be preaching. Somebody said, Pastor, I'd love to see you. I said, well, I'm not hard to find. Every Sunday, I'm up on this stage preaching. If you want to find me, come to church. I, you, you won't even have to look. I'll be right in front of you because that's my assignment from the Lord. And I, I hope the anointing makes it better. I hope the anointing makes it deeper and, and richer and I, I'm better able to do unto whom much is God uh, given, much is required. But here's the question. How can God empower us to perform something that we're trying to escape from? How can God empower me to be your pastor, to share the word and open your life and be your shepherd if I am trying to escape to someplace better. Because somehow God has anointed me. Uh -uh. You don't need a better assignment to get a deeper anointing. God said, I want you to go back down there and learn how to and and, and learn how to tend sheep like a king. Because I'm going to teach you something down there in those fields that will make you worthy to wear a crown one day. Because how are you going to lead people if you can't even lead sheep? See, don't wait for a better assignment. Where are you now? I mean, bloom where you're planted is what I'm saying to you. Quit looking around for somewhere else to go. Quit looking for some higher calling and some... God has anointed you and he's called you there and he says, grow where you're planted. Don't wait for a better assignment. How are you going to be a better parent to a teenager when you can't even parent a toddler? How are you going to go to college and have a wonderful career when you won't even study enough to pass junior high math? Come on. David got anointed and then went right back down to the sheep field. Listen, in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, David's going to meet Goliath. Uh, and when he meets Goliath, he's going to be standing there, and Goliath's going to make a challenge to the Israelites, and he's going to hear it because his daddy sent him down there to see how the boys were doing on the, on the war front. And he's going to hear it, and he's going to get so 
angry about what Goliath says and the insult. And he's going to run back to Saul and he's going to say, Saul, let me out there and fight that fella. And Saul's going to say, well, you know, try my armor on. And here's a little skinny thing about this big and the Saul's head and shoulders taller and everybody else puts his chest plate on him and it probably looks like a, you know, the old tin man on Wizard of Oz. Doom, 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 doom. His arm won't even come out the hole. David said, I don't think I can use this stuff, man. I got to use my weapons. And so Saul, and, and, and Saul said, no, I can't let you go down there. And then here's what David said. David said, well, Saul, listen, listen, I know, I know you don't think I can do it and I know you think it's bad, but I'm going to tell you something now. Here's what happened. I was taking care of my father's sheep and a bear came out of the woods and was going to eat up my sheep and I got him and ripped him apart and tore him up and then a lion came out of the woods and I grabbed him and ripped him asunder and and, and I, if, I, if a God that can empower me to beat a bear and beat a lion, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to stand in the way of God? I'm just saying, work where you are. It's going to be, it's going to be four more years before David even sees Goliath. Four more years before he even encounters Goliath at all. Keep doing what you do. Bloom where you're planted. Until God tells you something different, keep on doing what you do. Do it with greater passion. Do it with greater urgency. Do it with greater thought. But keep on doing what God has called you to do because God is building something in you that when it comes time to expose it, it's going to, be, it's going to accomplish a purpose. So don't look for somewhere else to go to get a greater anointing for a greater purpose. Most people, when they hear the word anointing, they think, great, a new job. (laughs) Get a promotion. Uh Uh-uh. Right back to the field. Here's the last little thing. Affirmation number four. I have nothing to prove and only one to please. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Several years ago, wasn't it Dr. Dr. Pepper, like, 13, 14, somewhere right in there, and they had that, that slogan that was uh, that you are one of one. You know, you're, you are a special one, you're a unique one, and they had those commercials, and the conclusion was, I am one of one. Well, that's what God's saying. God is saying, look, the anointing frees you up to live knowing that you are special with God. You are, you are not one in a million you're not one of 500. You are, you are the only one that is made like the one that you are. And, 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 and even though, uh, you know, you may struggle with sensing the uniqueness of God in you, I'm just telling you that to God, God sees you not as one of a big old group, but just as the one that he created you to be. And so you can stop the audition. I mean, you don't have to keep auditioning for the part. You already got the part. God's already given you the part. So you don't have to keep coming in trying to do better and be better and, 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 and arouse people more and let people see you. Life gets tough when you, when you try to keep getting, getting, getting the part. And let me just show what I mean. I know this is probably just staggering around, not making any sense. Let me just say it about, about me. Look, it is not hard for me to preach. I can preach on about anything right. at any moment you bring it up. So it's not hard for me to preach. But what is hard for me is if I convince myself that somehow I've got to be better every time. Like somehow... If I don't do better next week than I did this week, then I'm going to be a failure. Or you guys are going to quit coming to church. And that's a lot of pressure on me because that means every six days I got to come up with something new and exciting and alluring because I'm auditioning to try to stay where I am because I believe somehow it's based on my performance that I do better. Look, I don't have anybody to please except God. And, 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 and many people, listen, many people live trying to prove something. 
And if you live trying to prove something to somebody, you're the smartest. You're the richest. You're the most educated. You have, you, you, you're more excellent. Just choose your, choose your poison. And you live trying to prove that it's going to kill your life. Because nobody can live under that kind of pressure. If David had had tried to, God, I got to keep doing, I got to keep going. I, I, I can't go back down that sheep field. I got forgotten that sheep field. Nobody's going to notice me in the sheep field. I've been out there with those sheep all the time. I know all, all those sheep already know how good I am. I got to get in there with some people. God, get me some people. Yeah. I mean, if David had something to prove, he never would have accomplished his purpose. Here he is, the king of, the, the, the king of Israel with a bunch of sheep and nobody's even noticing how wonderful he is except the sheep <laughs> God gave you the job look when he anointed you he gave you the job he empowered you he equipped you seven sons passed by Samuel the prophet seven in scriptural numerics means what you guys completion right Complete. God completed the earth in the seventh day and he rested. Seventh day is completion. So seven sons pass by Samuel and Samuel doesn't choose one. And then here comes the eighth one. Eight means what? New beginning. So on the new beginning, God created a new beginning for the nation of Israel. And, and, he, and he gets this fresh horn full of oil, which is a fresh anointing. And, 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 and he moves in and he anoints this eighth son that nobody expected. Uh, God's creating a new beginning. God's creating out of a most unlikely place, a most unlikely person, a most unlikely situation. God's purpose has been accomplished. And I'm just saying, have you, have you heard that? I know some of you that are older, like me, uh, you've heard that hymn, uh, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. You remember it out of the hymnal? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Stand your feet.